Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Good morning, and welcome to this Sabbath's morning study. As we return to what we were beginning to address this last week, should we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his direction, and for his blessing, so that these things that we consider may give us indications and direction as to where we are to stand and how we are to speak in these days at this time. Shall we now ask for his blessing as we open his word to understand that which is now before us? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you have provided through this last week. We thank you for the blessings that you are providing now. Help us, Father, so that that which we do may bring glory to your name. Father, there are many points that we need to more fully understand so that our characters may become like yours. Forgive us of our sins. Direct us so that we may more properly represent your character in giving your word to this world in its last days. Do with us as you will. Help us that we may surrender all so that your will may be done. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We pray for your angels to attend us, for your spirit to guide our minds and to open our thoughts so that your will is done here. I thank you for each one that is attending this meeting. I thank you for those that may attend later and watch this via the Internet. Help us now. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Part of the challenge that I gave last week was that we each needed to read letter 31 of 1891. Part of the challenge that Theodore gave this last week was that each of us needed to view Kelly's Vespers from last Friday. Now, we're going to look at this first paragraph from letter 31, and we're going to turn back a little bit and consider some of the earlier paragraphs as well. As Mrs. White connects this portion with Ezekiel 33, she makes the comment, let not books be placed before the workers, which if they do not mislead and corrupt the mind, will still give to the mind a disrelish for the word of God, which brings to view matters of eternal interest. Let the truth of God be subject for contemplation and meditation. The Bible is God's letter to man, in which is instruction as to how to become rich in heavenly graces to secure for the believer the life that shall measure the life with the, the life of God. Read the Bible and regard it as the voice of God speaking directly to your soul. Contemplate this point directly, that we are to read the Bible and regard it as the voice of God speaking directly to your soul. Then will you find inspiration and that wisdom which is divine. There is no time for engaging in trifling amusements and the gratification of selfish propensities. Now, here she is very specific. Is she saying that we are to take the word of man as the voice of God speaking directly to us? In any way, are we to substitute the word of man as being above that of God. No. Okay. Thank you, sister. Now, I bring this up because I was having a conversation with a friend last evening. And this friend has been having difficulty and consternation over the fact that there are many points that have been written in specific books, even those that Mrs. White has given an endorsement upon, where these men 
have chosen to use the word of man or to twist the word of God. This letter is extremely direct and offers multiple points that we need to consider. Now, I'm going to read from some things that I'm not going to be able to place onto this screen. But all of this is from letter 31, 1891. And if you choose to look these up, this particular letter is published three times. Once where it gives the paragraph nomenclature, once where it does not, and then once where it is a pamphlet, because it is pamphlet 152, Special Testimonies Concerning the Work and Workers in the Pacific Press. Paragraph number five. Had Pharaoh accepted the evidence of God's power given in the first plague, he would have been spared all the judgments that followed. But his determined stubbornness called for still greater manifestations of the power of God, and plague followed plague, until at last he was called to look upon the dead face of his own firstborn and those of his kindred, while the children of Israel, whom he had regarded as slaves, were unharmed by the plagues untouched by the destroying angel. God made it evident upon whom rested his favor and who were his people. Although they had erred and had become tainted with idolatry and had almost forgotten him, still he remembered his people and his covenant with their fathers. Is there a present day application for this paragraph? Can we see items of what has occurred in the last four and five years in the situation that she is describing here with Pharaoh? She continues, the more Pharaoh resisted and rejected the light, the greater was his stubbornness. For as he sowed unbelief and stubbornness, he reaped again that which he sowed. The Lord has given great light to those in the office of the publication at Oakland. And some, for a time, walked in the light afterward, failed to do so by not continually keeping the heart surrendered to God. And the result was that darkness came upon them. They lost their sense of sin and did those things which the Lord had plainly showed them they ought not to do. Are we to cast aside any light? No. What are we to do with the light, sister? Share it. Are we not to gather all of the light in order to be able to share it properly? Yes. Now, if we resist and reject the light, are we not acting as Pharaoh did? Yes. Can we set aside any of the light that has come to us over these many years? No. Yet what are we seeing today? Basically a falling away. Exactly. Does God forget his people when others are choosing to fall away? God does not forget his people. Ever. Right? Mrs. White continues, God forces no man's will. We have the freedom to choose. We have the freedom to gather light. We have the freedom to set light aside. We have the freedom to follow God. If we choose not to follow God, who are we following? There are only two classes there is not a third there is not a fourth not a fifth not a sixth not a seventh there are only two god forces no man's will all are left free to choose whom they will serve they may listen to suggestions of satan and come to look at matters as he does 
reasoning after the same manner. And the same result will be that they will follow the same course of stubborn resistance to the light that Satan pursued in the courts of heaven. Those who reject the light which God sends them will walk in the sparks of their own kindling and will lie down in sorrow at the last. Isaiah 50, verse 11. If we are choosing to accept the word of man above the word of God, we have a problem. Satan is beside them to influence them in a course of evil. And as they yield to him, they influence others to take the same course. They do not realize the sacredness of the things of God. But in spirit, they conform to the world and fail to live the divine life, which is opposed to the world and its customs. They have a knowledge of the truth, but fail to bring it into the inner sanctuary of the soul. And they may be sanctified through the truth. How many of us are seeking today to move beyond justification and to live sanctified. There are three steps in order for us to go through the sanctuary. If we are not willing to take the first step, we will never make the second. If we are not willing to proceed from the first and move on to the second, how can we ever come to the third? If we will not then grow in the second and walk into the third and be willing to be judged where we are judged righteous by Christ, how can we ever become glorified? I have been aroused by the Spirit of the Lord to sound an alarm that these world-bound souls may be awakened to the peril in which they are placed through the course of their backsliding. For Christ's sake, let all those who profess to be Christians depart from all iniquity, all dishonesty. For Christ's sake, for your own soul's sake, I urge you to reform. Let there be a solemn consideration of your privileges and responsibilities. Let there not be found among you a selfish earthly ambition for place and position or money getting. This spirit prevails to a large extent in our institutions, and the religion of Christ is brought down to a low, common level. Paragraph 26. It is time that you are occupied with serious thoughts, and you cannot dwell upon the self-denying, self-sacrificing life of the world's Redeemer and find pleasure in jesting and joking and whiling away your time by indulging in foolishness. And yet, those who have professed to be followers of Christ have been guilty of these very things. Sins of no light character have been committed by those who have been in the truth for years who have had great light, great privileges, and responsibilities. But turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? Ezekiel 33, 11. Make a complete surrender to him who has given himself for you, that you should not perish, but have everlasting life. John three sixteen. Does Christ accept half-hearted consecration. Can we serve him with one foot in the world and one foot in heaven? For Christ's sake, see to prostitute your powers to the service of self. What does that sentence say to you? What is this saying? That we are to cease to prostitute our powers to serving self. If we are choosing to serve self, we are not serving Christ. If we are not serving Christ, we are serving the adversary. Put your undivided interest in the work that has been committed to your hands. Jesus is looking upon you to see what 
spirit you will manifest in the little things of your earthly life. You are now determining what shall be your destiny hereafter. And heaven is worth everything to you. If you accept the grace of Christ and the gift of his righteousness, you may show by a consistent life that Jesus is all in all to you. His service is reasonable, for he has redeemed you, and every power of your being belongs to him. Brothers and sisters, how many of us today can show in our lives complete, total, unrelenting commitment to Christ? Letter 19D of 1892 states it very bluntly. Shall these heart-searching truths continue to be passed by with the with indifference by the churches? The loss of the first love has opened the door to a great amount of selfishness, evil surmising, evil speaking, envy, jealousy, and hard-heartedness. What church lost its first love? The Christian church and the early something. Okay, now when we're looking at this, if we are looking at the book of Revelation and we take a look in Revelation 2, here we have the list of the churches. We begin with Ephesus. Is Ephesus the church that lost its first love? Yes. And we read that in Revelation 2 verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Is this a warning to Laodicea, or is this a warning to all? If the first church, the one closest to Christ, can lose its first love, then it's something that we need to bear witness for. We cannot afford to lose our first love. What was the first love of the Millerites? The second appearing of Christ. Would we also not say that the first love was their understanding of prophecy? Okay. Is the prophetic understanding of Scripture important to us today? It's very important, especially okay. the new rule. Exactly. Should we set aside our understanding of prophecy? No, we should not. When we hear and when we see these words that Mrs. White presented, the loss of the first love has opened the door to a great amount of selfishness, evil surmising, evil speaking, envy, jealousy, and hard-heartedness. Have we not seen this occurring within this movement? I haven't. I've watched it occurring when I'm watching people be cast out. I've watched it occurring when I have had to hear from others that, well, you can't trust this person. You don't understand this person, so... We understand him better. Just let him go. Don't listen to what he has to say. Is that the kind of attitude that occurred in the upper room? No. There was uh, love and also coming together in understanding. Exactly. Mrs. White talks of the evil speaking, the envy, the jealousy, and the hard-heartedness, and says this is the fruit born when the fervor of the first love has grown cold. There has been but little restraint upon the tongue, for prayer has been neglected. A pharisaical righteousness has been cherished. There is a deadness of spirituality and a lack of spiritual eyesight is the result. What church is it that needs ISAB? The church of uh, Laodicea. The church of Laodicea, exactly. The seventh church. 
We cannot afford to be Pharisees. We cannot afford to be spiritually blind. The only hope for our churches today is to repent and do their first work. The only hope for the movement today, the only hope for us today is to repent and do the first work. The name of Jesus does not kindle the heart with love. A mechanical former, formal oxidy, orthodoxy, excuse me, has taken the place of deep, fervent charity and tenderness to one another. Will any give heed to the solemn admonition, turn ye, turn ye, for why will ye die? Fall upon the rock and be broken. Then let the Lord Jesus prepare you, mold and fashion you as a vessel unto honor. Well may the people fear and tremble under these words, except thou repent. I will come unto you quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place. To what church is this written? Of the seven churches, to which church is this written? Laodiceans. Except thou repent, I will come unto you quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place. Revelation 2 verse 5 is written to the first church, the church that has lost its first love. Each of these warnings are given so that we will see the effect that is going to follow when other things come into place. If we cannot reason from cause to effect, then we have issues. The first church has lost its first love. If that first church chooses not to repent, its candlestick will be removed. What then? If the light that is in thee become darkness, how great is that darkness? Matthew 6, 23. Can we hide a candle, a light under a bushel, and still be able to give light to others? No. Then what are we to do? Is not the Savior clear? Let your light so shine before men. And what will happen? I was thinking in answer to your question that the light that we give could be darkness if we're in error, thinking right. that it is light. We have so, many times that there are books, there are pamphlets that others write that may have scripture in them, but may not have pure light. We have to consider carefully that that is being provided, that which is being disseminated. The spirit will not always strive with the heart that is filled with perversity. The infinite forbearing one who paid the price of his own blood to save his people is addressing them. Who will hearken to his warning? Have the churches that claim to believe the truth for these last days been fruit-bearing trees of righteousness? When we studied in the first portion of Zechariah, we have these two trees. And from these two trees are golden pipes. And what flows from those golden pipes. It's the oil of the Holy Spirit. Exactly. Now, can the Holy Spirit, can the oil of the Holy Holy Spirit come into unconsecrated vessels? God must prepare the vessel to receive it. But, and we okay. must cooperate with that. Right. But can, can that oil flow into unconsecrated vessels until it is consecrated 
Okay, so the answer would be no, right? Okay. Why are they not bearing much fruit to the glory of God? Why are they not abiding in Christ and going on from strength to strength, from character to character? The word of the Lord to his people is, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Ephesians 6, 10, and 11. Why are the people thus addressed, degenerating into weakness and inefficiency, not having the love of Christ burning upon the altar of their hearts, and therefore unable to kindle love in the hearts of others? Are we to walk in to churches? Are we to address others? And tell them, you're doing all this wrong. Here's what you need to do and why you need to do it. Is that the spirit of Christ? No. Yet how many times do we see this occurring? We cannot afford to be the people that are turning against our other brothers and sisters. If we are so doing, we need to repent. We cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit until we are the consecrated vessels, until we have allowed Christ to mold us into the similitude of his character. God's people have evidence piled upon evidence. They have truth powerful and convincing shall it be kept in the outer court so that it does not sanctify the soul again if we consider this which we read just a few minutes ago had pharaoh accepted the evidence of god's power given in the first plague he would have been spared all the judgments that followed. But his determined stubbornness called for still greater manifestations of the power of God, and plague followed plague, until at last he was called to look upon the dead face of his own firstborn and those of his kindred, while the children of Israel, whom he had regarded as slaves, were unharmed by the plagues, untouched by the destroying angel. God made it evident upon whom rested his favor and who were his people. Although they had erred and become tainted with idolatry and almost forgotten him, still he remembered his people and his covenant with their fathers. Here it's interesting that the plagues, interesting that the plague that God sent upon Egypt were actually to get through. But his heart, his heart, the material of his heart hardened against that trial that was designed. Well, I, I was reading this the other day. I'll just share it quick. Okay. God has shown me that he, God is, it's a early writing to page 47, the trial of our faith. God has shown me that he gave his people a bitter cup to drink, to purify and cleanse them. It is a bitter draft, and they can make it still more bitter by murmuring, complaining, and repining. But those who receive it thus must have another draft, for the first does not have its designed effect upon the heart. And if the second does not affect the work, then they must have another, and another, until it does have its designed effect. Or they will be left filthy, impure in heart. I saw that this bitter cup can be sweetened by patience, endurance, and prayer, and it will have its designed effect upon the hearts of those who thus receive it, and God will be honored and glorified. So the different reactions, like God, to correct us, all these things that we see in the church, God's going to shake them out. I'm not giving up on God's church. The, the, the people that are doing all of this, things that are, you're mentioning, will be shaken out. They won't be left to criticize the church and God's people anymore. They'll stand on the outside looking in to do that. So 
let us let the drafts of bitter drafts that God gives us in our life to have its designed effect upon the heart. Make us humble with him. That's what I'm getting from so far, the other side of things. Okay. Anyone else? Now, our situation right now, we need greater consecration of our own so that as God continues to provide the fires that drive the dross out of our lives, we may come together to understand the work that he is doing. We're not here to criticize one another. We are here to band together. We are here, as did the apostles and the disciples in the upper room, to meet together, confessing our sins to one another, to pray together, to be able to go forward together. God's people have evidence piled upon evidence. Do we not have evidence? Light after light after light of how God has been leading this movement for more than the last 30 years. Are we to allow this to remain in the outer court, never allowing it into the heart, never allowing it so that we become sanctified? Oh, we have plenty of time. I still remember well, standing in front of the spouse of a leader in one church. And I was told very specifically, Christ might not come for another thousand years. So why are we so focused and so so worried about needing to make changes? We have plenty of time. Too many times, this is the attitude that we find within the church. Another, because we, I'm sorry, brother. Because we don't realize that probation can close at any time. Exactly. Also a fulfillment of prophecy. The, our father, ever since our fathers, fathers have fallen asleep. Christ has not come. And he's not coming anytime soon. Adventists are giving up the foundation of Adventism, really. Yes, agreed. Shall the candle that once burned brightly, sending its light amid the moral darkness of error, gradually go out until it is quenched in darkness? How was it with Ephesus? How was it with the first church? She knew not the time of her visitation. Is that not a powerful statement? The first church knew not the time of her visitation. We have had evidence piled upon evidence. We have had light upon light sent our way. Can we at this time discard any of the light that has come to us before? Can we afford to turn back the clock and say, oh, what's gone on in the last 12 years is not of God. We need to turn back the clock and ignore everything that has occurred for the last 12 years. Kind of like a repeat of history. Exactly. With Millerite history being repeated. Kind of. My question is this. Where will we go? I mean, if you ain't got mm. that, where, where, where do we go? Mm -hmm. Ain't nowhere to go. The, the thought that was actually going around 2017, I think, was that we were going to start another church, and we were trying to think of a name for it, and that God was going to give us a name for it that uh, we could get, then give the message to the 
Adventist church. That was that was a subtle subtle error deception. I never really was fully in on that idea. Well, Most, mostly on the sidelines watching. I I was asked very directly last night. Have I ever heard of the Seventh Day Church of Revelation? Apparently, this is an offshoot. People that are a little frustrated with what has been stated by the corporate church. And they wish to differentiate themselves. I find it of great interest that there are those of us within this movement that grew up around or in the Seventh-day Adventist church. But if, if we sought to identify ourselves as a separate church or even as an offshoot, that we could be facing legal ramifications. Not so if we wish to become members of the seventh gay Adventist church that's been formed in other states. Ephesus knew not the time of her visitation. She did not heed the solemn admonitions of God. Ephesus did not heed the warnings given. Pharaoh hardened his heart and did not heed the warnings given him. Can we say then in this example that Ephesus hardened their heart? She did not maintain a vital connection with Christ and grievous wolves entered in and spared not the flock. That church, once beloved of God, that might have sent her bright rays amid the moral darkness to enlighten many souls, permitted her light to go out. Brothers and sisters, do we want to permit the light that has been granted us to go out? Are we willing to turn our backs upon that which God has been showing us these last 12 years, these last 30 plus years. Because once we start turning our back on light, how far back do we go? Now, letter 94 of 1892. While we continue dealing with this, as we look, here we have a, a very blunt comment. This is a non-published. Where Mrs. White writes, I thought I understood my son, but I do not anymore. I have seen that every effort I have made to break the spell of temptation upon you has failed of the desired effect. It has seemed only to make you more determined. You have hated reproof. You have despised counsel that in any way interfered with your plans. And as far as you could, you have carried out your own ideas until you could go no farther. Is this the course to be pursued in the work of overcoming? I have no hope of any change in you for the better, unless you shall see that your own will, your own way, your own independence can no longer be a controlling power. Unless your will is yielded up to God's will, you will find it hard to work in whatever you undertake, for the Lord is not with you. What she's saying here, what, to whom, and what is she addressing? Letter 94, 1892. I'll have this opened here in just a second. Letter 19, letter 94, 1892 was written to James Edson White on the 5th of May of 1892. So, we're talking about the seventh day of the second month. 
I review my, I review the past, my life in connection with yours, and here is my burden. How many mistakes and misapprehensions have I made in seeking to help you out of financial embarrassment only to start out afresh and repeat the experiment? Here I want to know just what to say. May the Lord help me to see my accountability, what I have done or said to place you in your present position of backsliding from God. I have been awakened by the words addressed to you by Jesus. Turn ye, turn ye, why will you die? Every moment of your probation is precious, more precious than fine gold. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Seek the Lord with all your heart. Call upon him while he is not. Here we should see Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. It is not yet too late for wrongs to be righted. God has borne long with your perversity and his hand is stretched out still. How hard is this letter to be written by a mother to her son? How difficult is this for her to have to say to one that she loves so much? I may again cross the broad waters, but as I now am and have been for months, it would be simply impossible. We may never see each other's faces again in this life. I feel that my work is not finished. I do want my children to be children of God. I want them to have eternal life. I cannot endure the thought that one of them shall perish. I cannot write much more. My hands and my shoulders pain me so much. Edson, will you cast aside this letter as you have others I have written to you? What respect do you show to your mother to say not a word to relieve her distress? Will you relieve my mind by any expression? whether you receive or reject my efforts. She writes an additional letter, letter 56 of 1892, same year. It's kind of interesting that we have to jump backwards. Here's the letter 94 that was written in the second month. This is being written in the eighth month. Again, this is a non-published letter. It is written 252,000 minutes or five months and 22 days later. Is there anything symbolic about this that's of importance to us? What would you say? Between 520 in minutes. Exactly. Is that important to us at this time? Pen of Inspiration continues to write. I must now stop. I have no words I can use to express my sorrow. Nine months have I been greatly afflicted. But what joy it would be to me to hear that my son was walking in the truth, walking in the love and the fear of God. I feel now most surely that although Noah and Job and Daniel were in the land, they could save only their own souls by their righteousness. They could not save son or daughter. If you rush on in your impetuous spirit, as did Saul, whom the Lord told just what to do, and he did not obey God, but did just the contrary, then with the great light you have had, your case will be proportionately condemned, your heart be proportionately stubborn, and I must leave you with a just God, hoping that you will have some pity upon your mother and upon your wife. How difficult must it have been for her to be writing this letter? Here she is, six months after she was writing the first letter, and having to deal with this same situation. How hard is it for us today as children and as parents to be seeing those that we love walking contrary to the word and the law of God? Here she is noting 
that this situation was occurring with Edson and she's having to express her great sorrow. May this not be said of us, that we are the cause of great sorrow. How much sorrow have we brought upon God in the way in which we have approached things, in the way mm-hmm. in which we have expressed ourselves with other brothers and sisters? Amen. I pray for those people that I've offended. Okay. Because I can't go to them now that once we burn a bridge, it would be impossible. And if we went back a brother, not impossible, but close to it. And God, God follows after me, picking up the sometimes the mess that I can make, not intentionally, but by reaction or impulse. Brothers and sisters, I leave these thoughts with you for this week. There are many situations that we each need to consider. We are currently in a position where the message that is to be given cannot go out until we are in unity. We cannot be in unity when we are questioning, criticizing, and tearing down other brothers and sisters. We cannot be in unity when there are those that are choosing to cast others out because they disagree with them. No matter who is leading, if we're not recognizing that Christ is leading us, that we need to treat others as Christ would have them treated. That we need to follow his example to the letter. Then how can we ever expect our characters to be ready for his coming? Any other thoughts, comments, or questions at this time? I have a couple. I could, I'd like to share. Go ahead. Uh, early writings, again, Experience and Views, page 102. The servants of God who teach the truth should be men of judgment. They should be men who can bear opposition and not get excited. For those who oppose the truth will pick at those who teach it, and every objection that can be produced will be brought in its worst form to bear against the truth. The servants of God who bear the message must be prepared to remove these objections with calmness and meekness by the light of truth. Frequently, opposers talk to ministers of God in a provoking manner to call out something from them of the same nature, that they can make as much of it as possible and declare to others that the teachers of the commandments have a bitter spirit and are harsh, as has been reported. I saw that we must be prepared for objections and with patience, judgment, and meekness. Let them have the weight they deserve. The objections, let them have the weight they deserve. Not throw them away or dispose of them by positive assertions and then bear down upon the objector and manifest a hard spirit toward him. But give the objections their weight, then bring forth the light and the power of truth and let it outweigh and remove the errors. Thus, A good impression will be made, and honest opposers will acknowledge that they have been deceived, and the commandment keepers are not what they have been represented to be. That really described what Theodore talks about when dealing with uh, doctrinal errors that people pick up in in the Warburg Church, particularly how it's dealt with. I, I do remember the 2520 being discussed. The elder, uh, one of the elders, uh, in the sermons gave Theodore, I think it was Theodore, to speak, turn the next Sabbath to speak. And while greeting people, Theodore is sending out information against the 25 as people were leaving. And it was all done in a spirit of discussion. There And eating potluck lunch together afterwards. 
So this is kind of the counsel that I think that is being followed, that the, let the objections be expressed, give them their weight, consider them fairly with the person, and and then bring the light of truth and and they can see. Then they will see that they have been deceived and that the other commandment keepers are not what they were presented to be. You mentioned a message, just adding to that, about being able to convince or share the truth in the spirit of Christ. Uh, I thought this was good for us. The suffering of Jesus, his love so deep as to lead him to give his life for man, was again held up before me. Also the lives of those who professed to be his followers, who had this world's goods, but considered it so great a thing to help the cause of salvation. The angel said, Can such enter heaven? Another angel answered, No, never, never, never. Those who are not interested in the cause of God on earth can never sing the song of redeeming love above. I saw that the quick work that God was doing on the earth would soon be cut short in righteousness, and that the messengers must speed swiftly on their way to search out the scattered flock. An angel said, Are all messengers? Another answered, No, no, God's messengers must have a message. So earlier, I think you started out I think, uh, talking about going into churches and, you know, sharing the truth. This we need to do in that spirit of Christ where objections are met with patience and calmness. And that uh, if we're to do this work, we must have a message. God's messengers have a message. I'm, I'm trying to put that in a nutshell. What is our message? Uh, is it, can we make it a three-point answer or something? Three messages. What, what, what do you think on that, Dwight? What is our message? And how are we to become people like that, that when we meet objections, we patiently answer them. We don't get agitated with the opposer. Because that's how Jesus was. That's sanctification, I guess, the process. It's a good part of it. Okay. And that, that sanctification involves that bitter draft that God gives us. Have we not been yeah. seeing bitter drafts when... There's a rejection of a biblical message. Have we not seen a bitter draft from the reaction that came especially from the church and from within the church regarding the message of July 18th? Have we not seen a bitter draft even from those who once stood with us and are now standing in a different way? All of this has to be considered. So, any other thoughts or questions, comments at this time? Then let us close with prayer. Sorry. Okay, the comment from the chat, heaven is cheap if we endure suffering. Thank you. Then we'll close with prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to review, come to understand, and accept these words of warning. Help us now, Father. Guide us in all ways. May your will be done. We thank you for these hours of the Sabbath. Direct us now so that that which we do may bring glory to your character and to your name. Help us to walk with you, Father. For this we thank you and this we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen.